Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1994 comedy, Ernest Goes to School. Now, before I share any more thoughts on this one, I want to give a special shout out yet again to Brock for requesting this review, as well as uh, the remaining Ernest films. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to my PayPal or my Patreon. The links to both will be in the video description down below. Now, Ernest Goes to School is... No Billy Madison. Uh, this is pretty lame. Now, I thought that Ernest Rides Again wasn't that great, but I still would say that it was kind of a time waster for me because of Jim Varney. And the plot wasn't necessarily the most engaging, but it was still a hell of a, hell of a lot more interesting than, than whatever this was. There's a good chunk of this movie that's predicated around turning a marching band around, which that just shows you how bad this film is. It's written by Coke Sams, who uh, he wrote some of the other Ernest films. He was a producer on some of the other Ernest movies as well. This was the only other film he directed other than a movie called Existo, which was just a excuse to take shots at conservatives which i was like great really you had this guy went on to do a political movie great um a film that's so bad that other than people who were a part of the crew giving it positive reviews anyone else that's seen the film has outright said that it's one of the worst pieces of shit they've ever seen so yeah, that's not really the best uh, <laughs> career, so to speak, when it comes to Coke Sam's as a director. And I know I have mentioned in other Ernest reviews that I would have liked to have seen a different director other than John Sherry. Well, this is an ex example of how you should be careful what you wish for, because John Sherry is not behind the camera here. And honestly, it made me appreciate John Cherry so much more as a director because Coke Sam's, he has nowhere near the same uh, level of comic timing. The way that he shoots uh, uh, the film makes it look like a low budget, just straight to a TV movie, like not even straight to video, like straight to TV. It makes it look like an episode of Hey Vern, It's Ernest, which he also directed episodes of. So, uh, and I think that was like one of the only previous experience he had. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what you get here. You get an Ernest film that once again, looks very cheap, doesn't look cinematic, but this time around, it looks even cheaper than Ernest Rides Again, which is saying a lot because that film still looked pretty cheap. This looks like it was made for a budget of like 50 bucks and a, a, a wad of used chewing gum. Um, and Coke Sam's direction, it's just, it's the kind of direction that's trying too hard to be wacky to the point where it ceases to be funny. It's just lame. It's just so on the nose and just painfully overwrought and it, it, it's just hard to watch sometimes because the attempts to try to be funny try to be comical try to be over the top and cartoonish are just so forced and i i don't really feel that he did that much with the camera in terms of the movement or using different angles or different perspectives or really anything it's a pretty flat looking film about as flat as Ernest uh, looks at, at, in uh, the first five minutes of the movie when he gets ran over by the football team uh, during one scene. Um, it's just a film that really doesn't look great. It, it, it really looks super low budget, almost like an episode of like Beekman's World. Do you remember that show? It, it honestly gives Beekman's World vibes. And it's written by Coke Sams as well as Bruce Arnston. And this screenplay sucks. It really does. The only things that I think are somewhat salvageable, excuse me, about this screenplay 
is the concept of Ernest using some kind of Rube Goldberg uh, machine to make himself smarter? So you have the lovable lunkhead Ernest, and then you have Ernest, who's a uh, know-it-all and a super genius, and that that was something that enabled Jim Varney to have some fun and to play two different versions of Ernest. And that was interesting and, and kind of entertaining, especially when it comes to some of the, the deadpan and some of the uh, lines that the smart Ernest was given. But most of the time, it's a really hard film to sit through, in large part because of the, the screenplay and the plot. It's another one of those things where, oh, there's some guy who works for the school district who doesn't like this particular school and definitely doesn't like Ernest. And he wants to get back at Ernest and the school by forcing Ernest to get a GED. Otherwise, they're going to take over the school and merge it with some other school. And of course, there's there's drama involving the football team as well as a marching band, which I'm like. Those two don't really mesh very well. Marching band drama and football team drama. And Ernest goes back to school and the typical sort of stuff happens where he's bullied by the jocks and so on. And he's a klutz in the classroom. And the only other time where the script does anything that is just not usual stuff for an earnest movie or just for a, a lazy lame comedy is when it just does stuff that's so far out of left field it just makes you scratch your head like there's a whole scene in the film where Ernest goes into the hallway and now all of a sudden there's david keith in cowboy gear and he uh gives Ernest a hall pass and then disappears. Like, what the hell is the ghost of David Keith doing here? And and what what the what what why? Just so Ernest can get a hall pass? Aren't there other ways that Ernest can get a hall pass other than getting it from a ghost cowboy? Uh, or how about this scene uh, near the end of the movie where Ernest is doing his GED test or whatever? He's doing the big exam. And for some reason, he starts imagining the teacher as a police officer. And then in the same uh, sequence, there's a fly buzzing around the, the, the classroom. And the teacher just all of a sudden is now a, a frog and spits out a frog tongue and eats a fly. I'm like, what? Like, this is just randomness for the sake of randomness. And it's just a hallmark of just bad writing. Oh, it's just like, oh, it's an earnest movie. Uh, it's silly and dumb. Uh, the teacher's now a frog. Ha ha ha. Like, what? This was like, I would say, probably the most cartoonish earnest film that I'd seen uh, to date at this point. And that's saying a lot because Ernest Goes to Jail exists. But this... This was even more cartoonish because it had those just cartoonish leaps in logic that makes no sense. Uh, the final football game was an absolute uh, disaster. Uh, Coke Sam's and this other guy have either never watched a football game in their entire lives or did not care because the football game just features numerous instances of unsportsmanlike conduct, illegal plays, Things like that that would never, ever lead to a successful, let alone winning play in a football game. And if that isn't bad enough, you got the ridiculous concept of the football team getting knocked out and then getting replaced by the marching band. And the marching band is actually able to run plays with the help of Ernest. And like the stuff with the marching band too. speaking of the marching band, I did not care. I don't care about the band of marching uh, band misfits. I don't give a crap about that. 
And there's the stuff with these mad scientists who are using this machine to make Ernest smarter so he can pass his classes. And that's kind of there for me. But mainly it's just really due to what Jim Vardy brings to it, not really the screenplay. Because a lot of the stuff with that is ultimately pretty lame. And for a comedy, there's so many scenes that just aren't funny. Like the opening scene where Ernest is trying to mess around with the plumbing in the locker room. The sequence with him dealing with this vacuum cleaner. Uh, the random just lol moments like, oh, there's a cowboy in the hall, in the hall now. And he gives Ernest a hall pass. Um, there's other stuff involving Ernest too, where he's like making silly faces and stuff like that. When he's in the, the brain machine, the test scene, like I was telling you, there's a random sequence where there's a wrestling match. And it's not like a regular wrestling match for high school. It's it's like a WWF wrestling match with some guy in a mask. I'm like, what? <laughs> and there's a love story that's going on too between Ernest and the band teacher, which goes absolutely nowhere. Yeah, between him and Miss Flugel. Complete with uh, dream sequences where he's having daydreams and imagining dancing with her in a ballroom, dressing up uh, in a tuxedo. But of course, it's Ernest, so the tuxedo is still a vest and he's still wearing a hat, but this time it's all black. So it's, it's uh, Ernest all dressed up. And that's the gag. It's just lazy and uninspired and rushed and that's because it is this was made simultaneously along with the other three films that were uh set up during the deal with uh abc abc studios made a deal with m shell uh the production company that was producing these movies and uh the deal was for three films and uh the folks at m shell had the bright idea to shoot them all pretty much at once. So what you get is just an incredibly rushed movie. This is the only reason why John Cherry didn't direct this one is because he was busy working on uh, Ernest Rides Again and working on uh, Slam Dunk Ernest. So they had to find a director and so they brought in Coke Sam's. This is probably another reason why the writing is so bad and so lazy and so rushed because of the fact that Coke Sam's was also spreading himself thin with the other films at the same time. But I also feel that it wouldn't have made a whole lot of difference because it's Ernest goes to school. Like you get better, funnier moments with Ernest in school with the flashback scenes that Ernest scared stupid where he's writing on the chalkboard and, you know, get the, Get the little uh, uh, bits of comedy there with young Ernest. Like, that is funnier than anything in this movie when it comes to the school setting. And the only other times you have anything that's remotely humorous is only really due to what Jim Varney brings to the scene and not necessarily the screenplay. The plot is a whole bunch of who cares. Oh, Ernest, oh, he might lose his job as a janitor or might be let go from the school if he doesn't pass uh, his classes and get a GED. Um, the whole stuff with the football team beating the rival or, or winning the championship, the, 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 the sequences with the marching band, turning themselves around and going from a bunch of losers to winners. Like, I don't care about that either. They also recycle the same bits of drama from the last movie, there's a whole stuff where Ernest, it, well, not 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 from the last film. Uh, I got I got my I got my Ernest films mixed up from around this time. My bad. I was thinking of Slam Dunk Ernest, which recycles plot points from this. But yeah, you have the whole s sort of cliched thing involving Ernest, where he becomes smarter, and as a result, he becomes a jerk and he's selfish, and 
so on. You're like, okay, we, we've been down that road in a million other movies. So yeah, it's just one of those films where it's like, this only exists for money, for a cheap cash grab. And it looks cheap. It only gets cheap laughs. And I, ca I can really see why a lot of people got very tired of the Ernest franchise when the film series started to churn out films like this. The cast, I mean, other than Jim Varney and maybe uh, the duo of Linda Cash and Bill Burge is not really that great. Jim Varney, he tries. There's one scene during the, the test, the, the big test, where he's trying to open his uh, his uh, test uh, book and he's struggling and he can't get it open because the rubber band is just too hard for him to, to uh, cut. And so he's like struggling with it and even puts it in, in his teeth and is chewing on it and yanking at it. That was funny, not necessarily because of, uh, of the concept of, of the gag, but what Jim Varney brought to that scene with his just still relatively uh, brilliant usage of physical comedy. But even some of the other physical comedy bits were kind of just not really as funny because the direction wasn't as good and neither was really the setup. Just Ernest would just do random stuff and just be a klutz. And after a certain point, it just became so repetitive that there wasn't really any comedy to really mine from that anymore. And I will say this too about Jim Varney. He did a good job playing the smart Ernest, showcasing uh, the differences between the two. And he played him like a snooty, uh, uh, rich type, but it worked for the character. And it was a little fun to see Jim Varney play around with the, with Ernest a little bit more and play a different version of Ernest, a smarter Ernest. Uh, and he's still easily the best thing about the cast and arguably the best thing about the movie. Uh, Linda Cash and Bill Burge. It was fun to see Bill Burge again. Linda Cash as Gerda, the mad scientist. She was kooky and, 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 and was fun to watch, at least to me personally. Um, but the rest of the cast who played the marching band members like Jason Micah as Donald, Sarah Chalk as Maisie. Yeah, the same Sarah Chalk who was Becky, you know, the second Becky Connor and Roseanne. Um, Gabe Kahuth as Rodney or even Kareen Colslow as Miss Flugel. Didn't really do anything for me. Or Russell Porter as Brad, the, the, the jock, the bully. Or Will Sasso. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, Will Sasso played that. Yeah, he played this character named Russell. So, yeah, Will Sasso as, as Russell, who was like the other bully. I did not buy Will Sasso as a jock. That was terrible casting. Apparently, this was his first acting role. Definitely showed here. He was nails on the chalkboard annoying in this with his goofy laugh and just the way that he just said his lines and just acted like a big overgrown toddler it was like his character in Drop Dead Gorgeous, but turned to 11. And th there's no explanation for that character being that way. You know, like in that movie, he's disabled. He's mentally disabled. So, so you know, he's, he's aloof. This character is supposed to be a regular dumb jock. And it's just so bad. Uh, uh, Will Sasso would definitely go on to do a lot better things later on in his career after this movie specifically on mad tv i mean he still absolutely uh makes me laugh my ass off when it comes to his uh, steven seagal parodies on on mad tv as well as other stuff i thought i i honestly will sasso is one of my favorite mad tv cast members but he's awful in this um you also have um like I said, David Keith, who has just a random cameo as this cowboy named Squint Westwood. 
I guess he uh, was able to take a break from filming a Major League Two to be able to do the cameo here. <laughs> um, but yeah, not the best cast other than Jim Varney and maybe a couple other people like Bill Burge and, and Linda Cash. Uh, the cinematography, like, come on, it's a, it's a super low budget comedy that went direct to video. There's not much to say about the cinematography here or the editing by Chris Ellis, the music by Bruce Arnston, Kirby Shellstad, typical generic, just simple, uh, tracks that you've heard a ton of different times and a ton of other, uh, comedies from around this time period attempts to try to create a catchy theme song or fight song for the high school football team. But to me, it doesn't really work. It, it's not that catchy at all. Um, and yeah, it's only 89 minutes, but it, it drags. This is like the first earnest film that I watched that really dragged consistently because I just wasn't engaged by the plot. I wasn't really engaged by any other character other than Ernest, except for maybe the mad scientist and Bill Burge, um, who was her assistant. But other than that, like I didn't care about the marching band. I didn't care about the, the teenagers that he supposedly befriends throughout the movie. I uh, didn't care about the football team. Um, and I am a fan of football. But, like, the football scenes in this are some of the worst I've ever seen. Like, it really is. It's some of the worst football scenes in any motion picture. Like, it's so bad it makes the football scenes from uh, that uh, Roseanne TV movie where she played football. I think it was called Backfield in Motion. It makes those scenes look amazing in comparison. It makes the sequences in Little Giants look like you're watching uh, uh, legitimate highlights from the modern day NFL. Like that's how bad the football scenes are in this movie. Fucking Air Bud Golden Retriever. That has football scenes that are leagues ahead of the football scenes in this film. Uh, <laughs> it, it is. It was just astonishing. It was so shitty. It was so stupendously crap. And it was like I got hit in the balls with a football just watching those scenes. But, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about Ernest Goes to School, except this is really not recommended for anyone unless you were a diehard fan of Ernest and Jim Varney. Otherwise, just skip it. You you really do not miss anything. Trust me. Maybe check out the clip where he's struggling to open the book, the test book on YouTube or something, and you know, call it a day. Because otherwise you're just stuck with a really lame sequel that's incredibly rushed and lazy. But anyway, thanks for watching my review of Ernest Goes to School. And until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.